Case at 12. The night beat starts right now. A downburst leaving some damage behind. We want to get to a new image just into our newsroom. Yeah, this tree appears to be pushed back onto a roof. Some of the bark also stripped away. This is on Paddock Drive near Callahan and Culebra. This was taken by one of our KSAT viewers. Meteorologist Adam Kasky keeping an eye on the activity tonight. Adam? Yeah, and this is a thunderstorm that had no real radar signature of anything that could be that strong. Nonetheless, it did cause a little bit of damage out there, likely with a downburst wind, which is basically a wind that goes straight downward, hits the ground, and then spreads out laterally. And the area that was affected this evening was roughly within 410 here, near Holmes High School, toward Calabria Road, Callahan, and Farragut and then westward towards SeaWorld. So roughly this area I circled here briefly affected. And what I think happened tonight was this small area of hail overwhelmed the updraft and quickly rushed out of the storm, dragging a lot of cool air with it that hit the ground, spread laterally and created a few gusts up to nearly 60 miles per hour. One recorded just three miles east of SeaWorld of 62 miles per hour. So there is this zone right here on the northwest side of town between SeaWorld, Holmes High School, Calabria Road, 410, Stevens High School, where we do have some power outages and damage. I heard from a viewer on Farragut Drive who said that a fence blown over and even some trees and some limbs down. So I'm waiting on some of those photos. Anyway, that was one little freak part of the story. Storm. Again, not even detectable by radar when it moved through there, but that's what happens in some of these situations. So thank you to our viewers for reporting that to us. And you look at the activity now, it's all come to an end. A few little lingering showers out there. By and large, you picked up some decent maintenance rain across parts of San Antonio. Basically, I-35, the delineation north and west of I-35. Some low, some people had over an inch of rain. We're going to talk more about this and, of course, the heat that's in place and more rain chances and storm chances tomorrow coming up. Thank you, Adam. Counterfeit car parts causing concern. Investigators say one man had more than half a million dollars worth of those fake parts in Bernie. Eleven vehicles also seized. The Kendall County, Kendall County Sheriff's Office says Today's bust comes after a month long investigation. 40 year old Nadir Ahmadi arrested this morning. He faces a first degree felony charge of trademark counterfeiting. Investigators say some of the counterfeit parts were shipped to Ahmadi from foreign countries overseas. And now Homeland Security and a drug task force are also part of the investigation. We actually went out to the business involved today. Empty boxes and a hood remained outside of the property called Prestige Off Roads. This is on off I-10 rather in Bernie. Most of the counterfeit parts included grills and bumpers. Also some concern some customers may have these counterfeit parts on their own cars right now. If you're a customer of Prestige Off Roads, uh -huh. go to a dealership and have it checked out and make sure it's safe. The Kendall County Sheriff's Office's brand protection agents from Ford, Jeep and Toyota are involved in this investigation. A night beat update on that crash on Vance Jackson near I-10 via officials confirming a driver was hit or struck by another vehicle before veering into oncoming traffic around four o'clock today. Via says that driver then hit a utility police and a via bus stop. That driver did hit one person, but it's unclear if that person was waiting at the bus stop or if they were walking in the area. Both the driver and the person hit were taken to the hospital. She fought for our country and dove into danger to help children caught in the current of the Guadalupe River. 22 year old Cassandra Kendrick died during the rescue, along with 30 year old Victor Villanueva. The 19th's Jaffney Gray spoke with Kendrick's family who say she dove in after seeing the father and his children in trouble. A beautiful soul. She was always there. Hard worker. That girl never stopped working. And hard headed. She was stubborn and she was always right about everything. Yes. Those are just a few ways loved ones described 22 year old Air Force veteran Cassandra Kendrick. She went by CJ. She was an old soul and a young body. For years, CJ and her family visited the Guadalupe River for fun, but Sunday she made the ultimate sacrifice. The Guadalupe County Sheriff's Office says CJ and her family stepped in to help a father named Victor Villanueva save his three children from a strong current near the FM 1117 bridge. Villanueva handed his children off to CJ. When he knew his kids were good, 
He was gone. He was gone. CJ passed the last child off to her family before going under with Villanueva. Dragged that baby right above her head, and I didn't even see her take air. Her body was later recovered at 8.45 that evening. I used to go home, and you expect her to walk in and be like, what are y'all doing? Why are y'all sad? You know, cheer up. For the last time, in honor of CJ's bravery, strength, and legacy, the family swam out to the very spot where she took her last breath to release flowers and say their goodbyes. They hope her story encourages safety and awareness for other families. Something like this happened to us, and we know the river. It could happen to anybody. The family says CJ's motto, to live life to the fullest, which is what they're encouraging everyone to do. They're raising funds for funeral expenses, but they're also praying for peace for the family of Victor Villanueva. Jaffney Gray, KSAT 12 News. Thank you, Jaffney. Our coverage continues on ERCOT's call for conservation. The Texas power grid operator still needs people to limit use of electricity and officials say they still don't know what's led power plants to go offline unexpectedly, causing strain on the grid. Typically, most of the facilities are brought back into service by mid-May after undergoing summer preparations. In a statement, the grid operator says in part, quote, ERCOT will be issuing a request for information from generation owners to better understand why so many units are out of service and determine any further actions that may need to be taken, end quote. The city's cooling centers will remain open through Friday. One family able to get a break from the heat at the Westfall Branch Library. There are a lot of locations available. We have the entire list on KSAT.com. Families relying on their air conditioners at home may want to be vigilant. Overstressed systems could lead to a, to a need for repairs in a time where part supplies are running low. The night team's Petty Santos reports. Thursday last week is really when we started seeing our, our call volume increase. Chase Anderson with Schaefer Services is warning customers not to wait too long to deal with their old AC system. We are dealing with some pretty significant supply chain issues, specifically in terms of getting our, our hands on equipment, new HVAC equipment. A new system or even parts to fix a system could take a few days to weeks, he says. It's a problem industry-wide, nationwide. If you need a new air conditioning system, it will likely be more difficult this year to get your hands on one. He says the problem started when COVID-19 manufacturing companies shut down, add to it shipping problems, and now the surge in demand from people who held back on big purchases till now. Suppliers tell us the cost of some parts and supplies increasing almost weekly. If your system is in the fritz, be proactive. Get your service provider out to make sure that everything's clean and operating how it's supposed to. Maybe repair some of those parts and pieces on there that are wearing um, so that hopefully you don't have a major catastrophic failure of the system. Some companies might have supplies in storage, so call around. And have patience. The supply chain could take months to get back to normal. Patty Santos, KSAT 12 News. Other repair companies we called say the shortage is affecting other appliances too, like refrigerators, washers, and dryers. Well, one ceremony making San Antonio's new city council official. Councilman John Courage kept his District 9 seat after the runoff election, but there are new faces for District 1, 2, 3, and 5. All of them preparing to take on a new responsibility for their community. Congratulations. <laughs> Four new city council members taking their seats in today's swearing-in ceremony. Some are making history as outgoing District 2 council member Jada Andrew Sullivan pointed out. Jalen, you made history, baby. You made history. History. What I want you to know, I'm so proud of you. District 2's Jalen McKee Rodriguez now leading the office he once served. He is the first openly gay black man to be elected to the San Antonio City Council. The educator now working to make a difference beyond the classroom. As a teacher, I've gotten the opportunity to prepare my students for the world that exists. And now as councilmen, I'll be working every single day to build a city that they deserve. There were some emotions shared with the public. And I am so proud to be handing this off to you. 
I know you will do great things. Rebecca Viagran passing on the reins to her sister Phyllis Viagran, who was elected to represent District 3. Phyllis Viagran deciding to keep the same team her sister had in office. I, you know, they have uh, institutional knowledge and relationships with the neighbors, and that connection is going to be key as we move forward. Each district comes with its own challenges. Terry Castillo will now represent District 5 after Shirley Gonzalez reached her term limit. Councilwoman Castillo recognizes improvements to sidewalks, streets, and drainage are needed. I'm excited to get to work, and thank you to all my council colleagues who reached out right away, um, offering support and ready to get to work. Thank you all. Mario Bravo is bringing his own ideas to District 1 and a city that saw marches meant to hold police officers accountable. There's a model in Denver, Colorado that exists. It's a, an, an independent oversight department that supports the community when there's excessive use of force incidents. Meantime, the city continues to negotiate the new police contract and tomorrow, New Year's next year's trial budget will be discussed. We'll continue to follow any new developments out of City Council both on air and online. Still ahead on the night beat, a request for a boat at the Bear County Sheriff's Office delayed an Instagram post leading to concerning comments and a response from a county commissioner. Tonight, Sheriff Javier Salazar posting his own response on KSAT's Facebook page. It's coming up. And some concerning behavior over mask wearing. A cashier killed after enforcing a policy at one business. The gunman also taking aim at law enforcement. What witnesses and investigators are sharing next. A violent shooting at a grocery store leaves one person dead and a veteran law enforcement officer wounded. The violence sparked by a dispute over a face mask. This, as investigators note, a sharp spike in unruly passengers on planes, many triggered by mask mandates. John Lawrence has the details. Someone hollered, they're shooting, and I hit the floor. Gun violence at a grocery store in Georgia triggered by a dispute over a face mask between a cashier and a customer. He had a mask. She just a uh, very cautious person, so she had asked him to pull up his mask. He refused and um, walked out, came back in, and did that. The gunman left the store without buying anything, immediately returning, shooting, and killing the cashier. She was always nice and kind, and she was just trying to enforce the guy to pull up his mask. After killing the cashier, the gunman was engaged in gunfire by an off-duty sheriff's deputy working at the store. That officer was struck twice, transported to Atlanta Medical where he is in stable condition, and the suspect was struck uh, a couple of times, has been transported to Great Memorial Hospital. This, as the FAA says mask wearing confrontations have spawned about 2,300 reports of unruly behavior by airline passengers this year. We need to get this under control and that's what the, uh, uh, the zero tolerance policy is all about. And we'll keep it in place until the rates drive uh, back down uh, to where we have seen them historically. I'm John Lawrence reporting. The Bear County Sheriff's request for one boat growing into a much bigger issue. Now a police report is being filed after a county commissioner says a social media user threatened her family. And tonight the sheriff is commenting on KSAT's Facebook page. Sheriff Javier Salazar made a request for a new boat for the department back in April. Precinct 3 Commissioner Trish DeBerry said she wouldn't approve it without more details about cost and maintenance. Instead, funds for that boat were donated by the Black Rifle Coffee Shop. Its owner, Jared Taylor, who was upset about the delay, took to his personal Instagram page about why he was upset. Commissioner DeBerry says some of the comments on the original post underneath that original post were threats against her family's safety. We're coming after you. You better watch your back. Um, that kind of stuff, I mean, does give you pause for concern, especially when I have teenage children who are at home. In a letter, Judge Nelson Wolf also pointed out comments he described as sexist and vile. Today, Taylor, the coffee shop president, sent a letter to Judge Wolf saying, quote, I will agree that the public backlash against Trish was strong and in some cases used language that I would not have used. However, your beef there is with the commenters, not me or my company, end quote. 
DeBerry says she is taking that into consideration, saying she is still trying to figure out details of who the police report will actually name. Yesterday, Sheriff Javier Salazar has said he was unaware of the comments before reading Judge Wolf's letter. He also said he's putting together a new proposal for that vote. And while he was unavailable for an updated comment earlier today, he did post on KSAT's Facebook page tonight under this story, saying, quote, attention KSAT, no feud here. I'm just trying to do my job at no cost to taxpayers. Thanks, end quote. Oh, turning now to weather, let's take a live look outside with live camera. Everything's quiet right now, but uh, some parts of our viewing area did see some action earlier today, Adam. Yeah, a little localized area. We had a freak little downburst that popped up. One of those situations where it wasn't even really detected by radar. But take a look at this photo. Let's get right to it. This is what uh, looked like, I believe, near Farragut Drive. And this is basically just north of Calabria Road, not far from 410 on the northwest side of town there. You see a little bit of damage, of course, to the fence as a result of part of that tree falling onto it. And that's not the only uh, bit of damage out there, even just east of SeaWorld, some damage as well. So let's take a look at the radar over the past six hours. One of those situations where we had those pop up showers here and there. Some of them developed by these outflow boundaries that are, have been moving across parts of South Texas from pre existing storms. Most of the activities coming to an end. We have a few recent downpours that just popped up one near Mitchell Lake and one basically in northern Atascosa County, not far from Poteet. This action coming from Houston, making it into Lavaca County, Victoria County, likely you see some in DeWitt County and Gonzalez County, but I do anticipate it to really weaken and start to fall apart once it gets toward Seguin, Nixon and Carn City. Here's a closer look at the lone downpour in Southern Bear County right along 1604 near 281 and uh, one closer to Poteet as well. That's it. So here's the big picture. Most of the action across the state today. I-10 corridor and point southward. That's where we saw most of the shower and thunderstorm activity. Big Blue H, it's over the four corner states. That's where the heat is on right now in the 110s when we checked earlier today. I think it was about 114, 115 in Phoenix. What we have here is some moisture in the southern Gulf of Mexico that we're watching. This area of moisture, you can see it better on the water vapor imagery, uh, particularly right along the Mexican coastline here near the Yucatan Peninsula and over the peninsula. That's the moisture we're watching that's likely to push northward over the next couple of days and probably even develop into a tropical depression, maybe even a low end tropical storm. As we go through time, notice once we get into Friday morning, some of those showers getting closer to Texas. As of now, just like this time last night, all indications are that this is going to pass just east of our area closer to Houston, maybe even clipping parts of Matagorda Bay with some of that rain and then moving it through Louisiana and points to the northeast thereafter. So still looks like we'll be on the dry side of it. Of course, things can change a little bit between now and then, so we'll keep you updated. 95 is our high today, not far from the average, almost two tenths of an inch of rain at the airport. We have 70s, we have some 80s. It really depends on who saw rain where we had rain. We're in the 70s right now and most of us tomorrow morning mid 70s, but then we do it all again with the heat back into the mid 90s for high temperatures and another round of a few isolated to widely separated pop up showers and storms tomorrow afternoon. Then we're looking dry, especially into the weekend and even a little warmer 97. All right, thanks so much, Adam. All right, it's almost time for the Cowboys to go back to Cali. Yeah, and the, 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 the good news is the NFL has approved them to actually hold training camp back in California and Oxnard. What are those training camp dates? We will let you know when we come back. And the Texas State Special Olympic Games returning to Morgan's Wonderland and surrounding facilities coming up. Maurice has, has the ankle that uh, he's still he's, he's still working through. Uh, he won't participate. He won't participate uh, the rest of the mini camp. And uh, you know I'm just I'm just hopeful he'll be ready for training camp. That statement by head coach Mike McCarthy has most of us believing the Cowboys may have to kick off their training camp next month without their star wide receiver in big board sports. Pro football coverage powered by Davis Law Firm. Amari Cooper has yet to participate in any offseason activities, and now according to his head coach, there's a real possibility he will miss the start of training camp slated to start next month. Cooper's the Cowboys 100 million wide receiver slated to count $22 million against the cap for the Cowboys this coming 
rookie season. He was Cowboys' leading wide receiver last season, even with the loss of Dak Prescott, hauling in 92 receptions for over 1,100 yards with five touchdowns. He appeared in all 16 games for the Cowboys last season, but then on January the 7th posted a picture of his leg having undergone successful surgery. Now we learn it was a so-called cleanup procedure on his ankle. But again, no timetable has been given for his return. The other big question since minicamp ended is where will training camp be held this year after the COVID-19 pandemic shut down California last year. The Cowboys are announcing today, in fact, that they will return to Oxnard to host their 2021 training camp beginning on July 21st at their hotel headquarters in California. This will be the Cowboys' 42nd year they have trained in Southern California, the 15th year the team has spent all or at least part of training camp in Oxnard. And get this, fans will be allowed to watch the workouts again, starting with their first practice on July 22nd. This will be to get the team ready for their Hall of Fame game in Canada, Ohio, against the Pittsburgh Steelers on August the 5th, as Drew Pearson gets his long overdue induction into the Pro Football Hall of Fame. Cowboys were robbed of that opportunity to train in Oxford last year after the COVID-19 pandemic forced the team to hold all of their training camp at the Star in Frisco. We're learning more about the four-year rookie contract. The Cowboys' number one draft pick Micah Parsons has just signed. It's worth over $17 million, comes complete with a $9,781,000 signing bonus, and that, according to FanDuel, has the greatest odds of becoming the NFL's defensive rookie of the year this coming season. If that were to happen, it would be the first member of the Dallas Cowboys to ever win that award, which dates back to 1967. Today was the day the Texans, the Houston Texans, are supposed to kick off their mandatory mini camp, but instead, new head coach David Culley decided to cancel it, proclaiming there was enough attendance in the organized team activities to give his players a break before training camp. This, despite most of the coaching staff is new to the team, and Deshaun Watson is still a holdout. Many believe the real reason for canceling the mandatory team event was to avoid fining Watson for not appearing since he has held out of every other offseason practice so far this year. San Antonio Spurs assistant coach Becky Hammond is already slated to interview for the vacant head coaching job in Portland this week, but she is also on the list of candidates for the Orlando Magic, and now Boston fans like to see her on the list of candidates for the Celtics head coaching job. That's after Brad Stevens moved up into the front office to take over as president of the team after Danny Ainge announced his retirement. How do we know this? Because someone has put up a billboard asking Stevens to do just that, either Becky or former Celtics assistant coach Carol Lawson. Hammond played 16 years in the WNBA before she became a Spurs assistant coach in 2014, becoming the first female assistant coach in all of the four major sports in America. Like Becky, Lawson played 13 years in the WNBA before becoming the first female Celtics assistant coach in 2019 and is now the head coach for Duke. The Texas Special Olympic State Games returning to Morgan's Wonderland. A big announcement coming up. After the COVID-19 pandemic forced their cancellation last year, the Texas Special Olympics Summer Games are returning to Morgan's Wonderland and surrounding facilities this September. The major announcement delivered this morning that will feature a four-day competition at Morgan's Wonderland, New Morgan's Wonderland Sports Complex, Hero Stadium, Toyota Field, and Star, the South Texas Area Regional Soccer Complex. It's a return for us. We are so excited. You know, during the COVID it was so difficult for us and all of our athletes to be apart from each other. And really, you know, Special Olympics is important for the competition side, but for so many of our athletes, it's their social network as well. And, and to have a chance to say we're coming back to San Antonio and celebrating that is going to be great for us. It's only been 14 months, but it seems like it's been 14 years for many of our uh, individuals with special needs. And so to have the Special Olympics Texas back here at Morgan's Wonderland and to bring people from all over the state, athletes, uh, this is a big deal. And, and, and we're excited about it. Uh, it's, it's been too long. Uh, we tried last year, but just couldn't do it. And we tried earlier this year and it wasn't going to work. But now the timing is right and everybody's back and ready to go. It all begins September the 19th, runs for the 22nd, and it's also free and open to the public. A wild scene in Munich as a protester attempted to parachute into the stadium before France's 1-0 victory over Germany at the Euro 2020, but he forgot about the wires holding an overhead camera that caused him to crash, injuring the protester himself as he's out of control and several other people. In fact, the coach of the French team had to actually seek shelter in the dugout, and yes... He was arrested. We're not sure what he was protesting because I can't read what's on the parachute. It did not go as planned. Wow. It, then you can see right there, he gets hooked first of time, and then now he's going to get hooked again. Yeah, I forgot about that sky cam that yeah. can cause a little problem. Yep. Ouch. Technology, learn it. Go. All right, thanks, Greg. We'll be right back. <laughs> That's it for the night beat. Don't forget, Good Morning San Antonio starts at 4.30. Good night.